All right, well, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in, do some introductions, uh, give you guys a overview of what we'll be talking about today, and then uh, Proto can take it from there and give you guys some details on what he's been working on. Um, so uh, today, a little overview of kind of what I've been doing uh, marketing-wise, content creators um, from the development side, uh, what Chris has been working on, uh, contracts and testing out those contracts, and then production chains uh, from from Proto, and then the uh, front end, uh, you know, UI uh, and client side of things have all been, you know, progressing quite nicely. Um, I I do want to just uh, maybe preface this conversation. Uh, I know we had mentioned this on our last AMA, but we had originally said that we'd kind of like iteratively push out features into the testnet as they were done. Um, due to kind of the nature of some of the Stark Net and Cairo changes, um, Chris, you know, is basically making it so that all the contracts will be done at the same time. And, you know, that release is going to be a lot more robust, but uh, you guys won't see as much kind of iteratively pushed. So um, that that's, you know, um, we're, we're still actively working. There's uh, nothing wrong. It's just that it's going to be uh, more all at once than little by little. Um, and, and we're getting we're getting quite close. So uh, with that said, um, I'll start off by just kind of giving you guys a brief overview of what the marketing um, currently looks like. I know we don't talk about this very much, uh, but I am you know very heads down right now, uh, coordinating efforts with uh, quite a few different content creators. Um, so that involves reaching out to many, many content creators, uh, cold emailing, things like that, to try and get their attention. Uh, those who I can get their attention of, trying to convince them to actually build content for influence. And then those who are interested, trying to figure out uh, what the best videos are um, and, and when you know that's all gonna happen. I am having some pretty good success here uh, with you know uh, me pushing more and more uh, to get more and more onboarded towards launch. Uh, but the we already know, or some of you guys already know, we've onboarded a few with most notable Captain Benzi, who's been a very long time um, content creator for EVE Online, uh, has a fairly robust uh, and well um, mined community for influence. And I am uh, now at final steps to also onboard someone called Montu Plays. Uh, Montu plays is a strategy gamer, uh, plays a lot of uh, Stellaris and, and some other games as well, and has uh, over, you know, 100,000 um, followers or subscribers on, on YouTube and makes some really incredible content. And uh, right now we're kind of hashing out details on, you know, what videos uh, we might want to do, uh, what that's going to cost, and, um, you know, when, when that's all going to start. So I'm um, going to be continuing to do that with more and more creators. So that's just kind of a brief overview there to let you guys know that we are uh, working on marketing efforts. And that's not just the only thing that we're doing. Content creators is just one facet of that. You know, we're going to have events. We're going to have... Um, a lot of, you know, marketing pushes through partners and, and things like that. So um, we really want it to feel alive, exciting and, and you know, busy and fun uh, towards our launch, uh, both of the uh, test net and the full launch. So all of that is having to fall into place here pretty soon. Um, and then, yeah, moving into uh, development for the development side of things, um, Chris is testing out all of the contracts, like the core components that he has built. So um, this is huge, you know, the fact that he's done with those and now he is um, actually, you know, testing that out. Proto, you might be able to explain this a little bit better than me in terms of what that actually means. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, so when you're, when you're writing contracts or really any code that is expected to like perform in a very specific way um, and with sort of implications if it doesn't, if there's a bug and, you know, that ranging from exploits or just, you know, loss of funds or whatever, um, you really want to um, test it. And that doesn't just mean sitting down and like, you know, running through the actions yourself by hand. Um, obviously, every time you change a piece of code, that could actually break something and you wouldn't have to go through the entire game and every action in the game every single time you did that, that would just be impossible. Um, so, you know, basically in software design, there, there are various types of automated tests that you can run. Um, you write them and then you run them. Um, and so that's what Chris has been working on. He's been working on um, more or less unit tests um, for, for these um, 
what you know, we're, we're going with a, a, an entity con, um, controller, um, or sorry, entity component um, system framework, ECS framework, which um, a lot of other games, like you know, non non chain games, um, actually use that, especially for you know things like um, you know, sort of first person shooters and like games games where you have like a lot of things coming and going in the in the game engine. Um, they have these things called entities, and they can ha you can put components onto them. So like sort of different properties that that thing has. So like if it's something that can shoot, you'd put a, like a shooting component on that entity, or if it's something that can run, you'd put a running component on that entity, and um, that sort of allows you to. Um, modularly build the, the things that are in your game um, and the things that they can do. And then a system is something that updates several components at the same time. Like when you do something, like if you, you know, jump while shooting or whatever, it, it can update several of them at the same time. Um, and so we've been, um, Chris has been designing our contracts um, with that in mind, with like a, an ECS framework in mind. Um, so everything's sort of divided up into, into these um, components and these entities and, and systems that update them. Um, and what that means, though, is that he's been able to test, write tests for um, individual components. Um, so saying, like, you know, when this specific thing happens, um, make sure that the output of that, the outcome of that, like the changes to state, um, are exactly what we expect. So basically, a test would like spin up like a fake, you know, say a, a fake um, crew, a fake refinery, a fake warehouse with stuff, some stuff in it, another fake warehouse, and then it would like run a, a specific process, and then at the end verify that like the inputs are gone from the starting warehouse, that they're in the the outputs are in the, the output warehouse, you know, that the crew is unavailable for the right period of time. It verifies all the, the sort of changes to state that um, are produced by that that action taking place, um, and so so Chris has been able to write these tests for um, for the components and some of the systems um, to verify that they behave how they should. Um, and the more tests you write and the more thorough they are, like the, the greater the coverage, as it's called, um, you get for those tests, sort of the, the more reassurance you get that um, there aren't bugs that will actually break the game. Um, you sort of, you know, writing tests is more as much an art as it is a science where you're just trying to find all, figure out all the edge cases and all the things that could go wrong. And oftentimes you'll find a bug and then be like, oh, I didn't have a test for that. And you'll add the test um, so that next time you'll catch catch that thing if you introduce that bug again. Um, so you just basically want to make as many of these tests as you can. And so Chris has been working on that, um, building out our test cases, um, trying to make that suite as comprehensive as possible. And that that is kind of what will be the, the first line of defense against bugs or other exploits that get introduced into those contracts. Um, you know, obviously, we'll hopefully have some some other eyes on those contracts. I'll be doing a, a code read through at some point with them um, to sort of take my own look at things. Um, there'll be more eyes on that, but the test cases are sort of the first and strongest defense against bugs. So Chris is putting some time into writing those and, you know, the, getting us some really good coverage so that we'll be in a really good place in terms of things behaving how they should in the contracts. But yeah, as JP said, he's been really chugging away and, you know, it's been fascinating sort of hearing secondhand from him, you know, having conversations with him I guess, about certain game mechanics and how, you know, how he is implementing them and, you know, whether sometimes that makes slight changes necessary to the mechanics just to, you know, sort of squeeze into how we can best implement them. But most of the time it's been pretty, pretty straightforward, like exactly the mechanics that we, we have designed. And, you know, it, it's looking really good. It's really exciting to see these these contracts coming together um, in, in Cairo. And, you know, he's the tests are working, you know, they're running and they're passing. So it's, it's really exciting to see that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, <laughs> this is so busy that, you know, I, I don't know how much, you know, even his family gets to see him right now. Uh, <laughs> but it's all, it's all coming together. And, and I, I could not be more excited for kind of the progress that he's been showing us. Um, a lot of that hasn't, you know, kind of been pushed into what you can see yet in the client. But um, going into kind of the, the next overview or topic that I want to just kind of touch on was kind of that front end client, both the development and, and kind of the design. Uh, we're at the point that now because all those components and everything are, are ready or, or at least being tested, uh, that, you know, both Patrick and Sergey are coordinating kind of getting all of these pieces um, strung together. You know, you can't just put one piece out at a time when every system is connected. Um, so it's it requires a ton of back and forth to make sure that, you know, all of the nuances are, are thought about. And this is, you know, Proto, I know you you do a lot of uh, back and forth with Sergey when he pushes out design and to you know, comment on kind of what um, what could potentially be edge cases that we need to solve for. And so these are the small buttons that maybe you would probably never think of. But when it happens going to be really thankful that they are there so like you know emergency transport uh if you get jettison you know you can jettison out from your ship like these are all components that have to both be you know 
built in, in contract and also be designed for. And so um, that, that progress is looking really good. Um, personally, uh, I can't wait to get my hands on, you know, the, the internal team test net. I haven't quite been able to do that because, like I said, all the things are uh, not yet connected. Uh, but the, the progress is, is looking really good there. Um, then, you know, I think the next thing we want to move into, uh, Proto, the, the, the fun topic of production chains and crafting and where you're at with that. Sure. I mean, honestly, there's um, not a huge update from from last time, but um, what I've been working on currently, if the recipes are done, like the, as I think JP announced last uh, last time, the you know, recipes are all in. Initial initial recipes are all in, um, and I've been working on the timings for processes, um, which again is sort of this um, like how long a process takes, just um, the moment you start it, like you know how long the crew is going to be needing to be there to, to sort of get the process kicked off and then how long it takes as a function of how much you're, you're processing in that process. So there's basically two numbers for each, for each process. Um, so I've been going through and sort of filling in those numbers. Um, I'm doing a little bit less research than I was with the, the recipes. Um, those are all fairly well researched and, you know, I'm certain that there are errors there. I'm certain that there are things that are, you know, not quite as realistic as they could be, but um, they are as much as I could with the time and knowledge that I currently have. <laughs> so the so recipes are going to be really, you know, really pretty in informative. But I think the times will be a sort of more, um, you know, balanced, um, you know, in a way that's more sort of game game balanced versus like attempting to exactly model the real life, you know, energy costs or energy, you know, time costs for doing a particular thing. Um, so they'll be sort of more representative of those processes than like actually like carefully modeled out modeled out to be perfectly accurate. Uh, but I think they'll be they'll be really you know, solid for for making the um, various products that you're producing with these processes um, take you know amounts of time that are appropriate for the difficulty of making that product that we intend. Um, since obviously the the longer something takes, the more expensive it will be, and you know especially the the longer the things that you need to make that thing take to make, then the longer that the more expensive that thing will be. So it all sort of flows together. Um, you know, and that's that's part of the calculations I'll be doing as soon as I get to the balancing step, um, sort of modeling the costs for each product and then flowing those down to the things that are downstream from them and sort of incorporating that into the estimates of costs for those things and making sure that they are where we want them to be. Um, so this is an important step doing these timings. Um, and it'll also be probably one of the areas that we will be most inclined to adjust when we're doing balancing. Um, the recipes, you know, again, are pretty carefully calculated modeled um, to be pretty close to reality. And, you know, so tweaking those would be like, okay, we're going away from reality. Whereas with the timings, it's a little bit more sort of, I won't say hand wavy, but like, you know, balanced, um, you know, already with the game balance in mind rather than with the reality, as much reality in mind. And so those are a great lever for us to be able to, to adjust when we are going to balance um, the production chains a little bit down the road. Um, but that's coming along, um, hoping to get through that fairly soon. Um, but other than that, you know, we've, um, production chains are just one of the things I'm working on. Um, also, get, you know, as, as we were talking about, Chris has been working through the contracts and a lot of mechanics come up in the course of, you know, him working on that sort of clarifying exactly how something is going to work whether if there's an edge case there what we're going to do about it etc um so one um i'm, I'm trying to think of a few um, updates there for, for mechanic wise that you guys might be interested in one of them um, is actually fairly relevant we were this was triggered by our discussion about um how ships work when you produce them in the shipyard um so for background when you are transferring materials just like normal products um, for example you know if you produce some some iron from you know from smelting from from tainite or something um, when you do that, um, when you start the action that is going to create that product, you know, same thing for extraction where you're, you're mining something and, and it's going to go into a warehouse or a ship after that. Um, when you start that process, you select the destination for the thing. Um, but, and then it's actually reserved space in that, in that destination inventory. Um, so it, it says, you know, there's going to be a thousand tons of tannite or, you know, whatever you're producing here in four days. Like there's going to be a bunch of tannite there. Um, but we're going to reserve a thousand tons of space or whatever the volume equivalent is in this inventory so that you can't put something else in there and take up that space instead because obviously that would be a bad thing if you have a thousand tons of tannic coming and then there's something else there um, where it was supposed to go so we have this reservation system for inventories which stops you from from um, using that space you know you reserve the space and then when you complete the action and you finish the you know the thing that is going to put the, those materials into that inventory that wipes the reservation and just makes the, the materials actually be there for you know using for whatever purpose that you want to use them for so that's how it works for products, um, you know, anything that's in an inventory. 
but we realized that we actually have the same problem for ships, um, where you produce a ship in a shipyard, right? You have a production chain process, but instead of selecting an inventory for your ship to go into, because obviously ships are too big to go into a warehouse or go into a, another ship, um, it actually needs to go somewhere that a ship can be on the surface, um, which is either a, an empty lot for like transport or a spaceport for the heavy transport or for the shuttle. And so we had the same problem where it's like you start a process that's going to produce a ship. Um, and it's actually the same we realized also for when you land a ship, like it's coming down from, you know, from orbit and it's going to take a certain amount of time to get there. Um, but it's going to like an empty lot or it's going to a spaceport. Uh, do we needed some sort of way to, to reserve space in that in that empty lot or in that spaceport um, so that somebody else did, wouldn't come along and especially for the empty lot, they wouldn't come along and you know build a building there or try to land another light transport there sooner than you or whatever. And so your light transport gets there and realizes that there's no space and that would be a bad state to be in. Um, so the way we actually came down on that, and I think um, this actually applies to more actions than just ships, um, is that um, we looked at our, um, you, know, every, you know, in testnet phase three, you guys would be familiar with sort of the pattern of um, you start an action and then wait for it to finish and then you have to go and finalize it. Um, unless you had that session keys active with um, Archon Dex, which actually does that automatically, which is which is great. Um, but um, in general, like the, you've got the um, the start and then the complete um, pairing for each action. And um, what we realized is that we can actually, for many but not all of the actions, that complete is a little bit redundant. Um, we could actually implicitly complete those actions. And so what that means is that um, you know there would be a, an end time to that action that is saved in in the state of you know whatever you're doing. So for example, when you're producing a ship, you have it going to say an empty lot if it's a light transport, and there's a time associated with that ship, which is like when that ship will be produced. Um, instead of needing for you to go back and complete that action by doing another transaction on chain and you know sort of updating whatever reservation we would have created um, to be okay now there's an actually a ship there and now you can fly the ship and do stuff with it. Um, we realized that we can actually implicitly just like sort of associate that time with the ship and then not have a second transaction and just interpret it anywhere that's relevant that as soon as that time has passed that's associated with the ship like the production time then it just becomes available implicitly um, without any state changes. So what this means is that we got our reservation just by putting a ship there, like there's now a ship there as if normal, except that it has this extra timer associated with it. Um, so that, you know, once that timer expires, then the ship is available. Um, this implements the reservation. And it also means that we can cut off a lot of the uh, second complete transactions entirely. We just don't need them um, because we can do the same thing in a lot of places where you can use this implicit timer associated with something that's being produced. Um, the places that we cannot do that um, currently are places where there are output materials that need a reservation in an inventory because, as I already described, there is that reservation system that we already have for inventories, and that needs to be wiped away and replaced with the actual product. Um, we can't do that implicitly because products are, um, you know, they're fungible with each other in the same inventory. Like, there's no concept of, like, this lump of tannite and then that lump of tannite, and this one is reserved and that one isn't. We don't have that. We just have, like, an amount of space reserved and then, you know, a, a single pile of tannite. And so with how we've implemented that, we do need that second complete transaction for those. Um, and also any case that there's randomness um, that is involved other than random events. So randomness, for example, um, if you're scanning an asteroid or if you're doing a core sample, those have uh, sort of the commit reveal pattern that we need to implement. And so those require a second transaction as well. Um, again, if you have the, the session keys, um, our hope is that those won't be something you need to manually do even, even if they are there. <clears throat> but if you don't have session keys, um, activated for your account, then you will need to go and, and um, manually do uh, you know, those service transfers or production chain processes or extraction. Those are all things where something will wind up in an in a output inventory and you'll need to do that second transaction um, and of course sampling and, and scanning and all that. Um, but for a lot of a lot of our our actions, there's no need for that second transaction. So I think that that'll save a lot of thinking and it'll just be a good outcome. So that's one example of something that we realized based on the implementation that we um, discussions that we could sort of tighten things up and make the mechanics a little bit better um, for that. Uh, um, I think that kind of leads us into another topic that we wanted to definitely touch on today. That's transactions. Uh, you know, in game, and you know what 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 is a transaction? How many are players going to be taking? You know, what are the cost of transactions, and and what does that mean for you know like Starknet and things like that? So, um, I'll kind of just maybe do an overview, and Proto, you can you can chime in any time. But um, you know, I think anyone here already probably knows, but for anyone who maybe is unfamiliar, a game that is fully on chain means that every action that you take in game is posted to the blockchain and it has a cost associated with it. So um, when designing this game, 
you need to make sure that uh, actions are impactful and uh, you know that you don't have to do um, as many um, because you have to pay for them. Um, now, cost of those transactions is you know going to reflect on how many people or how many actions you take and and you know are comfortable with because the cost associated with it. Um, so when you think about that, uh, the average player, you know, or, or there's kind of uh, basic numbers being thrown around right now. And, and if you look at General Proto and I and a few others were kind of conversing about this earlier today. But, you know, let's say the average player right now takes 50 to, let's say, 100 transactions uh, per month um, in the game. And this is going to be uh, right now pretty cost prohibitive on StarkNet. You know, even on an L2, the average cost for an action uh, currently, and, and when I say action here, um, you know, Chris reminded me that this is kind of being calculated in the start and finish. So some actions are you need to start and finish, others are just start, but the average cost is probably still around 50 cents um, for that action. And so, you know, right now it's it would be pretty difficult to launch this game uh, today uh, with that cost and expect, you know, traditional gamers to to pay that. And also current community members, you guys um, don't want to pay that either. You know, you guys might be fortunate enough to have, you know, 0.1 Ether or something sitting in a wallet. And, and you might not think about it because in the days of NFT minting, you were spending $40 to mint a single NFT. Uh, but at the end of the day to scale a game we simply can't function on on that so we really have to look at starknet to provide the solutions um to be able to you know actually have cheap transactions and so that next um implementation that starknet is targeting um is the volition uh or eip 4844 um and i we're not going to get too much in detail about that but that vastly reduces the cost of transactions. We actually could get a little, little um, into detail so, there because I think it's, you know, sort of... In, oh, yeah. yeah I'll I, I, oh, I, you finish, but you're, you're more than that <laughs> after you finish. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, no, I mean, I, I think uh, just I'll finish this out and then we can kind of go um, a little bit deeper in, in terms of the game design and around volitions and maybe EIP for 4844. Um, so, uh, you know, with that, we're, we're seeing... I think at, at minimum a 10x reduction in in that cost, um, and and that's you know getting us to that kind of like five cent range um, per per action, and that's um, likely to be more like three and a half cents to ten cents because some some transactions are more computationally dense and they can't be um, you know condensed much further than than that, but. Um, that's that's just the be the beginning. There are still more improvements. Starknet uh, slash Starkware will uh, push out, and so will Ethereum, like EIP four eight four four, that will get us to that kind of like one cent slash sub cent mark. Um, that won't be right at launch. Um, that that's <laughs> definitely a. I I personally think that's probably like a, a year down the road. Uh, but in in terms of that volition slash uh, EIP four eight four four. Um, you know, we're we're definitely seeing that happening. You know, there's a lot of implementation and, and work being done right now uh, to get that. And at that, you know, we'll, we'll we'll just call it five cent mark. This game does become uh, quite easily playable uh, for you know most all users, especially at that kind of like fifty to a hundred transactions uh, per month. You know, that that's pretty easy. Um, set and forget. You know, you put ten dollars in your your wallet and it's going to go pretty far especially if you're you know converting any items back into um sway or or something like that uh and into eth for gas so um proto do you want to hop in and maybe maybe detail some of the <laughs> the summary that i gave sure um i mean i'll just give like sort of a technical overview of of the thinking that is going into this um Pretty much, when with a transaction um, on on blockchains in general, um, there's kind of two different main costs to that transaction. Um, there's the execution cost, which you can think of as like the amount of processing, the number of steps, like computationally, that have to go into running that transaction. If you're doing something like you know 
repeating, say, a, you know, a hash or, or looping through something a bunch of times, like, or looking through a huge array, you know, there's a bunch of sort of computationally expensive kinds of things that might need to happen in a transaction, especially with a game like this, where there's just all sorts of arbitrary math and, you know, logic being implemented. Um, so that's one, one type of cost. And then there's also the storage cost. Um, and so that, that is basically the cost to um, store a value persistently. Um, you, know, there, you can have all sorts of different variables in a, in a transaction that you know, get thrown out after the transaction is over, like you're just using them as part of your computation. Um, but then there's certain things that you want to keep, for example, like who owns an asset or, you know, what, you know, where is your building? Like all these sort of important questions like that need to be persisted on, on the blockchain um, indefinitely. Um, and that's sort of all the game state that you're you're you know, used to thinking about um, where your crew is, you know, like what they're doing, like all, all those kinds of important questions. And so that that is the storage um, and storage has its own separate cost associated with it. Um, and so the way that um, on layer one, if you were sort of just writing this game in, you know, plain old Ethereum, um, you would be paying quite a lot of money for, for both of those things, um, but especially for the storage. Um, storage on layer on Ethereum is very expensive because it's quite limited. Um, you know, you, you have to set these values um, and, you know, there's only so many, so much space you can you can take up in a block, um, to, you know, based on the gas cost of, of those storage set operations. Um, there's a limited amount of gas that each block can use up. And so, you know, you wind up with, you know, very limited amounts of storage that you can change. And that's why right, doing this game right now on layer one Ethereum just wouldn't, would never, you know, would not work. We could not you know, do that. It would just cost, you know, $50 a transaction or whatever. And that's just not, not workable. Um, and so the layer two, StarkNet, um, that we're on, um, is actually um, currently the, the genius of, of um, ZK rollups, which is which StarkNet is one of, um, zero knowledge rollups, is that they can actually create these proofs that um, you know, you, you, the, the rollup executes all these transactions and it, it compresses them down into this single proof, this mathematical proof that can then be verified on a layer one contract, which you know, StarkNet has one of those on, on layer one. And it's constantly rolling up all of these transactions on the layer two and compressing them into these mathematical proofs that can then be validated expensively. But like, again, keep in mind that there's potentially lots and lots of transactions represented by that single proof um, and validated on layer one. And so the, the, the data to do that, the data that is make, makes up that mathematical proof, there's a fair amount of it. Um, but fortunately, it doesn't need to be stored on layer one. You don't need to um, take all that data and like persist it on layer one indefinitely. Um, what you need to do though is you need to take all that data and send it to layer one and let the the contract like work through it and work through the proof and, and validate the proof and then it can throw that data away um so that's what's called call data that's something that layer one consumes as part of certain you know as, as part of transactions um and that's still fairly expensive because it's it's the gas costs for for call data is competing with all the other uses for layer one um gas you know so, for, so execution and storage like all those things are sort of on, on the same gas market with each other and so, um, you know, the zero knowledge rollups like StarkNet can, you know, can boil down their, their gas costs considerably by doing this compression thing, the, the execution costs by, by doing this compression thing. Um, and the more storage that you use on layer two, the, the bigger that gets because there's just, you know, the storage needs to be part of that proof and, and it sort of expands and bloats the, the size of that size of that call data. Um, and so what you wind up with is if, if you want to decrease costs for transactions on layer two, um, there's a, you know, you can you can either make the layer two more efficient so that it's better at compressing the, that data into the execution cost into into that proof, um, or you can reduce the storage usage, um, you know, which is not good for a game where you just need that storage. You can't get away with not using it. Um, or you can rely on the layer one to do something. And so there's a couple of different options right now that sort of sort of they're on the table for reducing costs for for Starknet you know, transaction costs. Um, I guess three actually that I, I can talk about. Um, the first of which is EIP forty eight forty four, which you might have heard of as proto dank sharding or blob space. Um, and this is uh, an upgrade to layer on Ethereum that's coming probably before the end of this year. Um, the exact timeline isn't quite certain yet, um, but it basically um, makes there be a second market so that you can um, have a whole bunch of this what's called blob data. Um, it's actually bid on separately from the the normal gas that you see you see for transactions. So you can actually have a, a blob carrying transaction that has a large lump of basically just arbitrary data associated with it, one of these blobs. And that data um, is actually bid on in a separate market from the normal gas that you see, you know, for like NFT launches, the thing that's the thing that spikes to the sky, and you, know, you have to pay extra money for your transaction on layer one. This is a separate market, and so it, it does not compete with all of the other gas. And that together with the fact that these blobs are like quite large, um, makes them a lot cheaper as a means of submitting data versus call data, which is the, the way that layer twos have to do it right now. And so, you know, roughly speaking, that's looking at, you know, a cost reduction potentially for this data of 10 to 100x once EIP 4844 comes out.
And so what that means is that layer twos that can use these blobs, which you know it's pretty trivial to switch over to using them from call data, can potentially see a reduction in costs for their execution and storage um, that are being pushed onto onto layer one. They can see a reduction in those costs of ten to hundred x, which is fantastic. I mean that's that's a huge huge boon for for everybody for all layer twos when that happens. So that's one avenue of, of cheapening these transactions that we're hopefully looking forward to, and that depends on layer one Ethereum and when they get that that upgrade out there. Um, that's the Deneb. Um, and you know, Denim Cancun um, upgrade that's coming. Um, and then there's um, Validiums, which is something that StarkNet can do. Um, and so this is basically, um, and technically it would be a volition. Um, what volition means is that um, contract creators on StarkNet can choose between whether they um, they store their state, the, the storage that I was talking about, like sort of the game state or whatever application you're, you're talking about, whether that state is stored, is it, whether that's rolled up to layer one, like usual, like, like it is in, in roll-up mode, or whether that is actually stored on a different data availability solution that may be part of StarkNet or might be an external data availability solution. Um, and those are typically much cheaper than layer one um, data storage or rolling up to, to layer one. And so if um, StarkNet implements a Validium, that means that um, you can, or, or the Volition on top of that Validium, that means that then um, we could choose to put most of our game data on one of these external, or, or on StarkNet itself, um, one of these external data availability solutions and um, bring down costs for storage in that manner. So this doesn't help with execution costs. So you know, if something takes a lot of compute, um, a Validium does not help with that. Um, but it does help a lot with the storage costs, which again, our games like ours have a ton of, like there's just all this state that needs to be changed every single time an action takes place. Um, and so if StarkNet implements that, then that will bring our costs down significantly as well um, for, for the storage portion of things. Um, and you know they, they've announced that they have Validium in, in works, and I think their latest, latest thing that they've publicly released is, is around quarter three. So that's you know, another avenue for us to bring those costs down. And I think that is also similarly in the 10, to, you know, 10 plus X range of, of cost reductions for our average transactions. So if either of those, those two things happens, um, we are in a place where we can, we can have those, those really cheap you know, 5 cent transactions versus the, the 50 cent transactions that on StarkNet today you would be seeing. Um, and then the third, the third avenue, which Bear's talking about is uh, this the, the magic of ZK rollups um, is that the more transactions you can cr cram into a block for a, a ZK rollup like StarkNet, um, the execution costs of those transactions are amortized, which means that they are shared amongst all those transactions. Um, and the, the costs of running one of these proofs on layer one is fixed. So you know if it costs five million gas to do a you know which is a large you know a lot of gas, so kind of expensive to do one of these proofs on layer one. But if you have you know a hundred or a thousand transactions that are in that block, like suddenly you've spread out that fairly expensive proof, so that it's becoming more and more trivial. Like the more the more transactions that are in that block on on layer two, just the cheaper that execution costs get, just like directly inversely proportional to each other. So that's the, that's the kind of dream of, of ZK rollups is that maybe someday they'll be so busy with just like tens or hundreds of thousands of transactions per block that it become the execution costs become negligible, like that they can actually be discarded. You know, you don't even need to think about them anymore because they're so cheap. They're just fractions of a fraction of a cent. Um, and so the more usage that we can drive to StarkNet, um, either with Influence or with other games, other applications, um, potentially the cheaper transactions get from that direction as well. So this is one that sort of hedges more on us having a lot of players. Um, the more players we can get, um, hopefully the, the cheaper that those StarkNet transactions will get, the execution side of things, not the storage side of things, that side gets. So taken together, these three options, uh, EIP 4844, which is coming to Ethereum layer one before the end of the year, hopefully, um, that, that brings down both types of costs. Um, the Validium, which StarkNet is working on and theoretically is still coming, is coming back quarter three this year, um, is that brings down storage costs and um, the sort of scaling with the number of users brings down execution costs. Those three things together are what we see making this game become very affordable um, going forward. But sort of the bottom line is that at this exact moment we're going to try to launch right now, we think that the costs would probably be more than, than what um, the average player would be willing to spend. And that is actually one thing that we would love to hear from you guys is just like, what are your feelings with what you would be willing to spend on gas to play this game? say per month, um, you know, what, where is your price point at, you know, and, and we know that a lot of you are in a pretty good place, you know, you have some of these more expensive assets, you're probably to, to, to pay more than the average player, especially from, you know, you know, places where people don't have a lot of money and, and just want to sort of play this, you know, this maybe a means of making money. Um, we're, we're very aware of that and we want to keep prices low, but we're, we're just also curious what our current community is thinking in terms of, of gas prices and what they're willing to, to spend per month on, on gas fees. Um, because, uh, you know, as you should be getting the impression here, like it does have some, you know, sort of 
implications for for you know timelines and you know and gas costs and how that all sort of fits together. So I think that's that's the overview I wanted to give. Yeah, and I also want to point out like we're not we're not saying we're pushing any dates. We're not saying any any timeline changes. Uh, at this time, and we are still, you know, as far as we're aware, you know, StarkNet team members are posting, you know, volitions are coming Q3. Um, so that that all aligns with kind of original roadmap. But again, I think we also want to hear from you guys to understand, like, what makes most sense to you? Like, what's what do you want more game come out soon? Higher transaction costs if, if for example, you know, that wasn't ready when, when we're ready to launch? Or do we uh, push game out a little further to launch game uh, with you know three to five cent transactions or or whatever it might be if if anything were to change we again I, I cannot stress this enough we are not saying we're pushing anything at this time uh, I think this is more just for conversation to try and understand some of you guys who come every week um, and and listen into these uh, because you guys are also probably uh, the most. Uh, anticipating of of the launch. <laughs> yep, and you know, I guess just to, to back that up, like influence is on track. We are we're hauling hauling butt on basically every part of this game right now. It's it, the pieces are really coming together, and you know, I, I couldn't be more excited to see see these contracts being written, seeing the front end coming together. Um, I think Patrick just wrapped up on marketplace work today, so the marketplace front end just got finished. You know, things like that. They're just coming together, and it's really exciting to see. And we're we're currently hitting our timelines for for this game. Um, you know, the things that we're building on top of are, you know, they're, they have their own timelines. And so, you know, that's part of just sort of this, this conversation that we're bringing up at the moment. And I think it's probably also important to say that we're going to have an entire game in testnet that you guys can play and have fun with. And we're going to be doing a bunch of events and, and things that, you know, bring players in. Um, and for all intents and purposes, that can serve as as kind of like the pre-release game. Um, so regardless of like timeline, uh, that that's going to happen before the official launch. And so you know, you guys are going to be able to get your your hands dirty and influence, you know, and then break some rocks and fly ships and colonize asteroids and, and things like that. So um, that's going to be super exciting. Uh, Kimmy, yeah, you're up on stage. What's up? Good. Hey, how are you guys doing? Uh, well, I had a question about these uh, transaction costs. Is this something like new, or did we know like that it's going to cost this much like when, from the get-go? When we initially spec like, out Starknet, when you guys decided to use Starknet, it was summer of twenty twenty-one that we that, that Chris decided on on Starknet. Um, the the you know the expectation was that these costs would be going down and they actually have been like over the past year i think starknet has brought costs down significantly by you know just today actually or i guess it was yesterday there was a, a big push big uh, update that went out and that has actually sped up things a lot and so like speed and, and costs are sort of two sides of the same coin in some ways um so it's like the faster the more tps you can handle the more transactions you can cram into a block which as i was saying can bring down execution costs proportionally so you know there, there have been all these updates that have been happening I think you know. Obviously, two years ago, the you know there wasn't even Cairo. There was no you couldn't do anything on Starknet. It was just a you know a plan that they they were working on and you know was was coming together. But it was it was not anywhere close to being something you could even run a game on. Today, you could actually run Influence on Starknet. Like the the tech, technology is there. It's just that the costs are still you know in that sort of fifty percent per transaction estimated range that we have. Obviously, now that we have contracts implemented, um, we have a better handle on those actual specific like you know estimates for costs per transaction. Um, it was a little bit more nebulous back back when when we didn't have those you know that code implemented and we couldn't be doing benchmarking which chris has been doing some of to sort of see you know what those costs might look like um now that we have the trend the, the contracts um the expectation though at that time was that costs would come down perhaps a little bit faster than they have <laughs> um but that's that's a an issue that's sort of space-wide that you know this is all cutting edge tech and like we've been you know pushing into these efficiency improvements and pushing into these sort of mathematical breakthroughs honestly like you know there's there's still math that's being figured out you know and proofs that things are being proven that you know, we can then use as you know sort of primitives in these cryptography you know applications like that that stuff is still happening sort of at a you know somewhat random pace and you know as, as discoveries are made and you know innovations are created and so, you know, this is where we're at right now. Like, we, you're sort of, you know, assessing things where we are with the contracts mostly written and, you know, with the information that we have now. And, you know, that's, we're just sort of looking at the, the costs as they currently are and, and what the, 
upcoming improvements are that and what those impacts will have on costs and sort of you know thinking about all that i guess that's the way to put it okay cool oh, please, um well i think uh, i would like to share my opinion about um uh, like transactions should we maybe uh wait for the release uh push it a little bit uh, further mm -hmm. i think it's a for for me at least i think it's a good idea it's not going to be playable if there is if it's like 50 cents to do one transaction um so in my mm -hmm. opinion we should maybe publish it on testnet uh, let uh, let us play let us test things out maybe wait a quarter or two more until transaction costs come down because even a transaction cost of one cent mm -hmm. is not there yet. Absolutely. Like if you look at any gaming uh, blockchain, there's way more transactions than a normal blockchain. Look at Ronin, for example. Co it costs less than a cent mm -hmm. to do anything. And I think that would be the sweet spot for influence. We're going to have tons of transactions. But yeah, that's just my opinion. Uh, and, thank uh, you, Kimmy. Great uh, work, guys. I see uh, what you're doing. You know, I it think, looks amazing. I think we all agree that we want transactions to be as cheap as possible. We're just trying to figure out what does the community think in terms of what's the happy medium to launching them? Because we don't also want to just sit on our hands with a fully fully launched game. But um, like you said, Testnet is going to be fully playable. And when we're talking about this, uh, and again, cannot stress enough, as, <laughs> stress this enough, we are not saying that we're pushing, we are talking here. Um, it wouldn't likely be you know, two quarters or anything like this. This is something that we are actively um, discussing with any and all teams associated with StarkNet, what their feelings on it, you know, what we think we can do to improve uh, transaction costs and then also aligning uh, timelines. Uh, I think that it's just timelines. It, it's not like StarkNet has said uh, volitions will be out on X date. So, you know, we right now just have the impression that it is quarter three. Um, and so is our our launch scheduled for quarter three. So you know, right now we're we're just pushing along as if we are we're launching exactly on time, and and we hope to do so. But if if things you know if the community both spoke up and you know or if the community really spoke up and said no, please don't do this. Like just let us play the test net for an extra month or something. Then you know we 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 might listen to that. <laughs> Um, Admiral, to your question about there needs to be, or more statement, but there needs to be clear criteria set and communicate for whatever decision is made. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think right now we're, we're kind of gathering that information from you guys on, on what some of your thoughts are um, to better um, create that, that set of criteria. One huge, huge you know, improvement that maybe some of you guys don't already know, but like go test out uh, StarkNet right now and see how fast it is. Um, comparative to where it was like literally a week ago, um, we're hitting just, I'm, I was playing the influence test net and things were completing in five seconds. And again, the way that we've designed this game it doesn't actually really matter how long that action takes to complete. Um, because you know, you can continue playing without that, that completing. However, this makes just the game experience uh, a lot smoother if you're trying to chain actions that have you know, times associated with them that are that are already short. So, you know, from from a speed perspective, we're we're pretty much there, um, and it's only going to get faster. And then from uh, transactions per second, you know, we're or from a cost perspective, not yeah. quite there, but we will be soon. Yeah, sorry, not transaction perspective, cost per <laughs> cost perspective. Um, uh, but this also this also you know depends. Uh, I think gnarly, you're here in the audience. Um, you were kind of mentioning your you know how many transactions that you want to do, and you know you're you were saying maybe that you'd want to check in every day and restart your extractors rather than setting them to like a five day extraction process. And you know at any cost, uh, you know probably ten cents or higher, you're, you're probably looking at not wanting to do every day. You're you're looking at five day. But you know again, these are all also strategic um, choices that, that, you know, are lumped up into 
what you actually think will be most economically viable in game. What 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 are you what are you trying to do? How are you trying to compete? What goods are you trying to sell? Where are you trying to sell them? When are you trying to sell them? You know, there's a lot of components to that in game that, that we can't just lump into cost of transaction. Uh, but uh, at the same time, if you're going to be doing hundreds of transactions yep. a week, uh, it gets pretty cost prohibitive. And also, we right. don't want you to be spending that much on gas. Like that doesn't right. help us. Won't be like, either. We're, I mean, we're not profiting from that at all. Like, that's, 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 you know, that's, the more we can keep it in game and, and you know, with unstoppable <laughs> games, like that's that's just better for everybody. So you know, that's definitely an important consideration for us. Um, Admiral and, and Nathrax actually together are sort of having a good question. Nathrax is asking when test net. Um, and Admiral is sort of saying, you know, like, where are we at? Like, what's left for the game? Um, so I can take a stab at giving a, like a, an overview of what is left um, at this exact moment. Um, so to the best of my knowledge, again, I'm not working on all these personally, but this is the best of my knowledge. Um, with the contracts, Chris is very close to, to contract completion for the actual um, mechanics for, you know, for the game, everything working. Uh, I believe that um, there may still be some work on the escrow contract, um, which is the the way that, you know, when you need to put up some sway that somebody else can then claim by doing something. Um, I believe that is not implemented yet. I could be wrong there, but I think that still remains. I think there's still some tests he needs to write. Um, he's working on, he has been working on that. Um, I believe um, any, anything else on that, I'm, I'm not up to date enough about to, to answer, but I think that um, by far the large, the bulk of everything has been Written and, and tested, in you know, so far. So I like I know things like the marketplaces, other than the escrow, um, have been implemented. I know that the you know ship travel obviously has been implemented. I know that the production chains he's he's worked through. That's working. That's all tested. You know, materials transfer, extraction, like some of that. A lot of the things actually got rewritten from testnet phase three because of Cairo updates, um, and also the update to this ECS framework that I was talking about. So you know he's done a lot of work to sort of bring that all into up to standard. That's all implemented. The traits, um, we're still there's still some balancing to do on the traits or figuring out exactly what those mean. But I think um, the the actual code to implement those is there. Just need to have some numbers filled in. Um, so again, the, the by far the bulk of the contracts are done right now. Um, there's some sort of finishing up bits that still need to be done. As far as the UI is concerned, um, I believe almost everything. Um, except the crew management screens. Um, I believe there remains um, some of the uh, leasing slash third party contract slash agreements and policies stuff um, that has um, is waiting to be implemented on, on finishing the designs, um, which, you know, sorry, is actually out for the last little while, but we'll be finishing those up very shortly. Um, but you know, the Patrick's been doing fantastic work on the front end. It's you know, it's not hooked up yet. It's it's all sort of fake data in the front end. Um, you know, it's it's been sort of you know, he's been working off the designs, and making sure that the the sort of buttons click and everything, but it, it doesn't connect up to anything at the moment. Um, the SDK work, which is the thing that um, our indexer. Um, or actually, rather, the, the library that um, is able to um, connect the contracts um, up to our, our indexer database, um, and then also partly to, to the clients. Um, so, sort of the you know the glue that, that glues those things together um, is being worked on right now um, by I think Chris and Charlie are working on that. Um, and that you know, so that I don't actually know where that is in implementation, but my impression that it is that's sort of halfway along. Um, obviously, the contracts have been being written recently, and so the SDK that connects to those, you know, is needing to come after that. <laughs> so, so I think they're sort of working on filling that in right now. Um, the the hooking up of the SDK and the client will come very soon. I think Patrick actually just switched over after he finished up with the marketplace implementation of the, in the front end. Um, switched over to working on the SDK, which has direct implications for him being able to <laughs> easily use the SDK to pull that data into the into the front end. Um, so he's working on he's on the SDK too right at the moment. Um, so that's that's making great progress. Um, the design work is again mostly there. I think we're still missing the crew crew management pages um, because that changed recently. The mechanics for that um, and the um, the leasing is still um, and sort of agreements and policies that that still has some polish to do. It's sort of halfway done. But um, those are the last big pieces that I'm aware of as far as the design side of things. Um, once those are in place, then, then the front end can be worked on. Um, in terms of the production chains, um, I'm still filling out the, the timings as I sort of expressed for the, for the processes and then have a balancing pass to do. Um, but those are the kind of the last steps for getting a cohesive exploitation package of, of production chains that we can we can run with um, into testnet phase four. Um, there is a step where we need to figure out the seating um, for the initial colony layout. You know, so so how Adelia Prime is is built out um, when we start. How all the the materials that are available for you guys to buy in the marketplaces to kickstart the economy. Like what those exact numbers are. We still need to, to figure those out. I believe a script or the the way of of doing that seating um, contract wise has been already implemented. 
but it's just a matter of, of coming up with those numbers to, to feed in there. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, marketing, I mean, JP gave an update on that. That's that's going well. So overall, things are, you know, very far past the halfway point. Like we're, you know, we're honing, coming coming in on, on getting what we need for testnet phase four. Um, there's still obviously some stuff to, left to do. We're, we're working on that. Um, as far as timings, again, I think the only thing we can say for testnet phase four is that we will give that two weeks notice. Um, and I think, you know, we still are on track for having a good period of time for te testnet phase four for a, you know, end of summer launch. So, you know, that, that's, that's, I think all we can give on that at the moment, but that's, that's my best overview. <laughs>
Uh, but there will be periods of time that I think we will open it back up and say, hey, new new patch live on, on Testnet. Come in and, and give it a try uh, for those who, who might want to do that. I don't know if that's going to be something that we end up kind of gating to um, certain people. Um, that way we, we kind of get quality feedback rather than just a hodgepodge yeah, of it. In the future, but, I mean, uh, testnet that, will be that's, place that's definitely be worked updates. out. So, you know, you'll always um, get testnet first and you guys will get a chance to try it and find any bugs and give us feedback. And then, then once it's polished and you guys are excited about it, we will put it live. You know, this is, you know, post exploitation, obviously, but that's the plan for testnet. Yeah, um, comment from Nathrax Gorley might be discontinued in January. Uh, we're actually in conversations with Starkware about uh, kind of the Sepolia testnet that they're looking at changing over to because Gorley, you know, is going to be discontinued. Um, so we're trying to get like firm timelines on that because the last thing we want to do is have, um, you know, pre-release launch in testnet with lots of fun events and things that are really going to push people towards the main launch and then um, them switching to Sepolia or Gorley going down. Um, so we're, we're being very cognizant of that as well. And yeah, comment from Gray Area. You know, um, if the testnet runs to launch and we're all practicing uh, with, you know, kind of your own assets or, or at least, you know, being able to obtain your own assets, then, then launch date not being you know, as important. I, I would tend to agree with that, but we also just don't want to make excuses for pushing out games. So we're working our absolute hardest to hit timelines that we have stated. Um, and if anything has to change, you know, it's it's only going to be because, you know, the community um, and is going to benefit Netflix, greatly that question, from that. You know, is there an actual average cost per transaction or per action that, that we're shooting for? The answer is no, we don't have a hard number that we are looking for. Um, to Admiral's point, maybe we should. Um, and I guess this conversation and our own internal conversations are part of um, potentially specking something like that out um, or, or making a decision that would be equivalent to that. So, you know, but yeah, we don't have a hard number of looking for. We are very aware that, you know, what, what the cost per action, you know, impl implies in terms of like who would be able to play this game and like what the cost per month of playing this game for an average player would be very cognizant of that and we do want to make sure that this game is not just a whale game like that that is not the game we want to play that's not the game you want to play so we you know if we can't launch with a game that you know people who you want to have to be playing this game can play it then then that's not you know the launch we want so Yeah, and, and I will say, you know, with, with Volitions, uh, you know, there have been some conversation, you could probably go look uh, on, on Twitter through threads, but, um, you know, three to five cents is very feasible. And, and I think launching our game at three to five cents might make a lot of sense. Uh, that that was a lot of sense in one sentence, but um, <laughs> uh, the reality is that that cost is going to come down over time, too. So, you know, at launch, it might not be absolutely perfect, but again, if we're waiting for absolutely perfect, no game in the whole world will ever launch um, because if you've ever seen a game launch, patches come out pretty quickly, new things happen, things change. And so we're, we're more than ready to, you know, apply better changes to the game to improve experience and lower cost. Uh, but we also want to be uh, making sure that we, we launch this game uh, in as timely of a manner as we possibly can. Yep, Juice, that's a great point. Yep, the higher the transaction fees, the higher the selling pressure on Sway to for the ETH to continue paying fees. So exactly like having lower transaction cost isn't just about who can play this game, but it's about how much money people are putting into the game that becomes available for others to, to you know, to get, you know, to be paid, including us as unstoppable games. Like, and we'll be perceiving the inflation from from Sway as as the game grows, as the player base grows. And if everyone's just dumping their Sway for ETH in order to pay for gas costs, then we, you know, price of Sway goes down, and it's not you know it's not the semi stable like we intend it to be. And then also we don't have any ability to really sell any for for development costs. So you know it's advantageous to all of us to have transaction costs be as low as possible. Um, I had uh, a question for you guys here. I think um, you will have some probably good opinions or, or strong opinions. I like strong opinions. But uh, 
I think I'm I'm debating in my head what would look best for kind of this testnet pre-release um, event and kind of uh, push into launch. Um, we all know that you guys own a bunch of assets and we want to make sure that you guys can kind of like test out your strategy and, and things like that. Uh, one downside to kind of having that initially, um, I'm not saying it wouldn't happen, um, and, and this is just uh, ideas here, so bear with me for a second. But um, to have competitions and to kind of have leaderboards and things like that, it would be extremely difficult to make it at all fair if the people who own lots of assets basically come in and build a bajillion things, and then the leaderboard is obviously going to show those people uh, at the top of the leaderboards when it comes to like most extractors built, most core samples taken, most land uh, colonized, whatever it might be um, that, that we could do as competitions. Uh, so I'm curious what you guys would think would be kind of like an opportunity to play with your assets, test out everything um, that you have. Also, um, a time period where you don't have access to those so that if we want to run competitions and things like that, that it's kind of equal footing. It's like everyone starts yeah, and I think zero to that point, and perhaps let's see one thing happens. that might have less of an impact on that is actually asteroid ownership, simply because squatting is a possibility. Um, and, you know, we wouldn't do anything that would require you to have actually owned the lots you're building on. Um, so, you know, a lot, having people be able to play on their main net asteroids, I think there's a lot of fun in that and sort of a hype value in that. Um, so, you know, and I think that that might not impact the leaderboard as much as it, you know, it could. So that might be something we could still roll with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's I like exactly. uh, Skippy saying competitions on gameplay, not wealth. A hundred percent. That is what we would like to do. Um, it just uh, challenges right. what can be put in as a competition. Um, so again, this is this is just us having the opportunity to talk to you guys, um, see what your opinions are, and kind of help um, yep. um, you know refine yeah, exactly. some of these strategies that we're I think, working yeah, on. To that point, like having crewmates come across from, from mainnet or you know be copied from mainnet onto testnet might be too much for, for that purposes, but for I think asteroids are probably more possible. And yeah, Kudo has a good point. It might not be that expensive to subsidize gas costs for brand new players yeah, for a few yeah. months. Um, we have talked about subsidies. Um, the, the bottom line is that for the number of players that we are intending to get um, for this game around launch and the average you know expected number of transactions and cost of transactions um, it actually is fairly expensive with with where things are at right now on test on starknet um as things get cheaper obviously that would be cheaper to subsidize as well um you know we might even want to look into that at some point but but uh, the bottom line is that like we you know influence the softball games could not afford to subsidize that um it would be awesome if somebody else, like say Starkware, wanted to do that, but you know that's in no way guaranteed. <laughs> but you know that that's sort of where we're at with costs. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, just to put it in perspective, um, you know, if we have ten thousand players taking a hundred actions at five cents a piece, um, hundred or a hundred actions uh, per month, um, you know, it adds up pretty quickly. But that's that's for an average player. You know, if you're a power user making hundreds of transactions, you know, it, it could very well get into the, the millions of dollars um, to subsidize. And that's also a reflection on, that just means the cost is probably too high um, for gas costs. And so like, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to release a game that, that would be around 50 cents per action like it would be right now. Um, so, you know, at, at the very minimum, you know, we need, we need that cost to come down, you know, I think, Cents are below, uh, and otherwise it's it's pretty cost prohibitive. Yeah, could could it, uh, I mean, if if you can convince Starkware to subsidize everyone's transactions on the on the chain, I mean, they're not going to do it exclusively for influence uh, <laughs> uh, for, for a while. That would be fantastic, but I, I don't think they're yeah. going to be... I, mean, I, I will I say, be, like, we do have pretty close communications with the Starkware team, and I I, mean, I won't say for sure, but I think it's a pretty good assumption that that ask will be made by one of us at some point. <laughs> and there's no guarantees there, but, you know, it, it would make a lot of sense, honestly, for them to, to think about that.
Yeah, I mean, and again, like we're we're pretty attached at the hip with them. We have a very good relationship with Starkware and Starknet, and we want to continue to have a really good relationship with them. And they're also very aware of these things too. You know, they're building something for uh, mass adoption. You know, they want jillions, trillions, quadrillions of transactions on their network, and they know that at higher costs, that's not possible. Um, it's so. You know they're working their hardest to also bring that down. So you know I, I think us pushing hard is only it, it's helpful. You know like we are, and and I I'm not trying to boast or brag for influence here, but like we are probably one of the most premier products on Starkware slash Starknet um, that is going to be ready towards like when they're ready to really try and hit the gas pedal. Um, so, you know, we, we do have a fair amount of, of sway here in, in terms of trying to get partners and things like that to help us out in one way or another. Um, and, and that's exciting. I mean, it's really, really fun to be kind of at the forefront of this technology. But at the end of the day, timelines on development stuff on new technology are really difficult to say, like, here is the date and it will be ready by this date. And so we just we're being as flexible as possible, but it's also getting to the point where we're, we're ready to launch um, very soon and we don't want to just be sitting on our hands. So we're going to be doing everything possible to make sure that we can launch when we're ready to launch. Yeah, well, I'll say that anybody listening in, if you have thoughts on the sort of what would you be willing to pay for transactions, um, you know, per month or, you know, in gas fees per month, like, where, where are your thoughts with that? We'd love to hear hear from you, you know, post it now, post it later. Um, we'll be sure keep, keeping an eye on that. That'll help us, us inform our decision on, you know, where we're going with that. Um, and yeah, um, Matthew's is asking, <laughs> just a last quick little question. How are the bulk abundances coming in, coming along? Um, so that depends on the result of the balancing, um, which I'll be doing as soon as I get these those timings done for the processes. So it's you know it's still waiting, it's still blocked by something I'm working on right now. But as soon as I get through that, it will be coming along pretty soon, and you will know what the the spectral abundances for for asteroids will be, the average ones, um, which will obviously inform how the, the, the that secondary scan goes for all these asteroids. Because you know, yep. I have to say, uh, Skippy, I hope that you RP this. You know, I don't condone nor uh, support, but, you know, from the perspective of do anything you want in this persistent world, if you can make a, uh, a living inside of influence uh, by, by running an RP uh, <laughs> establishment, yeah, go, the, go for the it. The reduction change is on. I think as soon as I get this, these timings done, before I even start the balancing, you guys will get the next version of that. Um, the one thing it won't have is actually the volumes of all the products in it yet. That's something that is not relevant for the balancing. And I, you know, so it's being, it'll happen after the balancing. Um, but I think the the change with the you know the recipes and the timings and all that in it will I will make that available um, as soon as the timings are in. So something to look forward to in the near term. Yeah, um, Proto. I know you probably have to jump any minute, and we're we're kind of over time. But um, I I do have some additional time. If you guys want to ask any questions, talk about strategy, you know, I'm I'm more than happy to stay longer. Um, honestly, we're getting to the point where um, we can answer a lot of kind of those strategy questions, or at least give give you know inferences <laughs> to what what it might look like to do certain things in this game. Uh, and and at that point, you guys can can actually kind of our um, free craft around what what the scan's going to look like. And again, at the end of the day, you know, uh, showing is much better than telling. And we are working on showing that that test exactly. net as soon as yeah. literally um, as soon as possible. Has a question: <laughs> What about sway unlocking? Does it have to wait till right before launch? And the answer is yes. That's our plan. Um, to give a little bit more detail on that, um, if we if we literally unlocked sway at the exact moment that that um, launch happened, then there would be a lot of sort of market things happening with Sway that would probably make the launch itself a little bit trickier because, you know, you don't want Sway going all over every which way you know, as people sort of try to figure out what, you know, where the markets need to be, you know, while you're trying to also like build your first value prime stuff like that, that just gets very complicated. So our intent is actually to, you know, basically have it at launch, but be potentially like up to a date beforehand, um, but very close to, to launch. 
And FX is asking, um, testing flight paths and seeing fuel consumption, is that planned for August? Um, I won't give a timeline on that, but but the flight paths and fuel consumption, those contracts are written, the front end exists, you guys have seen screenshots from it. Um, so I think, you know, when obviously testnet phase four will have almost all the gameplay, if not all the gameplay in it. Um, so those will be in there as well. And those are certainly, you know, as, as done as anything is at this point. So definitely you'll be getting those with phase four. And you know, you know, again, we can't <laughs> you can't give specific timelines for phase four yet, but you can you can sort of look at the broader picture of us still being on time to launch the game, you know, summer twenty twenty three if if the underlying stuff is ready and where we want it to be. Um, yeah, to and, and make some assumptions. <laughs> I uh, and I want to make I want to make one comment here too is because we are so close to launch, pre thing that we push out at this time is important and considered as impactful. So when we get closer to this uh, testnet launch, or as what I'm like, I'm calling right now is kind of the, the pre-release, we want to make sure that we can also align partners and marketing and everything with that too. And so it's a little bit of extra effort to make sure all of these things are planned and uh, put out just right. Um, so that we can make it as exciting uh, for everyone here, but also build the hype to expand into new audiences that we haven't been in front of uh, before. And so we're, we're being careful about this. We're being calculated. We're planning. And the game is coming together quite nicely. So uh, I think that'll probably be time uh, for today. But again, we we haven't we haven't uh, committed to any any changes in timeline. We're really really excited about the progress. Marketing is coming together. The client is looking fantastic. That will all get pieced together, and we'll probably be able to show some sneak peeks here um, fairly soon. I don't know exactly when the date is, and we will give you an absolute minimum uh, two week notice before any large events happen. Have a great day, everyone. Have a good day, everyone.